your chat Everybody behind social it's media. Really and all these and everyone really loves the Gucci. Gucci. Right, generations right addicted to phones. We're very forward looking. Care a lot about Extremely the future. Extremely overwhelmed. We're exposed to a million times more stuff than anyone before so us the was. The effects of climate change are going to be In my generation, I don't even think they're going to have kids. They're kind of anxious. I really it. hope that we can find a solution as quick as possible. Issue. Especially with older people, like when they say that, it's like, but it's our generation who's going to be living through it. We keep track of our time on this planet based on what material we have to build with. So you've all heard of the Stone Age, the Bronze Age. We live currently in the Plastic Age. Every year, over 340 million metric tons of plastics are produced. Nowadays, you hear in the news a lot about banning plastics. Plastic is really a miracle material, and it was created to solve a lot of other problems. It's, you know, what made uh, people able to afford things. People need clean supplies and drugs uh, that they can rely on. So for the plastics that we do need to depend on, how can we turn that into a circular model so that after their valuable use is not just going to landfills or going to our environment? So what we've invented is a new technology that can break down these currently unrecyclable plastics. We make building blocks from them. And from there, with these building blocks, we've also managed to develop ways to build back up with them. To actually solve a lot of the problems that we see, which are also huge opportunities, the first thing is to find people who are equally invested in solving the problems, and then to get together and reimagine what the status quo could be. I remember June 5th, 2005, I flew from China, my hometown, directly to Vancouver, Canada. And after 13 hours of flying, we were approaching the shore. So this is when the oceans turned into this beautiful greenery, mountains, and water. And I was quite amazed that this type of beauty existed in the world. While I've always been an environmentalist, I really shifted my perspective from, wow, things are so limited, and that's why we need to protect the environment, to, wow, things are so beautiful. I think I felt immediately inspired, excited, and grateful that this was going to be where the next chapter of my life was going to take place. We met each other in high school, and then what had a more fundamental impact was when we started working on the project to actually break down plastics. The girls came from different elementary schools, but they met and they were part of the recycling club together. Miranda and Jeannie were remarkable. They were amazing students. They were engaged. Oh yeah, they were motivated and they were very focused and committed. I really like the idea that students can actually do something like real science in high school. You know, just after their grade 11 year, they embarked in this contest, the Sanofi Biogenius Challenge, where they worked with university professors and grad students. So this is while they were in high school. They genetically sequenced this bacteria and designed an experiment where they provide strong support that this bacteria was metabolizing plastic. I seriously think that most people underestimate high school students. So at the end of the 11th grade year, I had the opportunity to go with a school bus of other kind of youth who are working in the environmental space in Vancouver to visit the Vancouver South Waste Transfer Station.
the most shocking moment for me was when you look out, you just see this gigantic pit of trash. When plastics get to that stage, they were beat up, they were contaminated with all sorts of food waste, it was stinky. I was looking and I just felt so, I just felt so sad about how humans have this relationship with our things, with our materials, where after we use them, we just throw them away and we don't care about them anymore. And all of these materials are sitting there with nowhere to go and we just burn them or we landfill them. It just felt really wrong that adults in the world were not doing the right thing and they were not even talking about it. They were hiding this thing, even though it was actually in the middle of everything. You cannot argue with the fact that there is 8 million metric tons of plastic entering the ocean every year. That's something that you have to address. This pollutant, it just gets in every species and every ecosystem. The amount of plastic that we've produced has grown so much that now it's going to be within the fossil record of the Earth. Obviously, what we're doing right now in terms of recycling is very energy intensive. So if we had a way to be able to properly break down that plastic into usable plastic to recirculate back into the economy, then that would be something revolutionary. I met the girls in early 2012. They wrote to me seeking mentorship for the Sanofi Biogenius competition. We came to Dr. Elta's with a proposal. <laughs> it was a very creative proposal, and I think that was perhaps very amusing for him. They were typical teenagers, but they had an unusual passion for big problems that were uh, facing humanity. My whole life I've grown up beside the Fraser River. I've seen that because of industry, the river is not as clean as it could be. The question is always, if there's pollution in the environment, then could you find natural organisms, microorganisms, that have evolved to actually feed on these contaminants as a food source? Because if they can, then that's actually a competitive advantage that they would have in their natural environment. So we went to four different sites and we collected mud samples. We went to a site that was a protected bird sanctuary and we went to a site really close to the landfill. We took these samples into the lab and uh, grew them in conditions where uh, the only food source we gave them were plastic chemicals. We learned that these bacteria were able to break down plastic chemicals in the natural environment, but they were doing it at a very slow rate. So to solve the plastic problem on an industrial scale, we thought that it would be important to understand how they were doing it on a molecular level and find ways to accelerate uh, that mechanism. And that was extremely inspiring for us and also made us realize the power of science, that if you can understand how these mechanisms work, then there, um, this could allow you to recreate them and to turn them into more reliable technologies. Our science fair project won a national award at the Snowfi Biogenius Challenge, and uh, that generated a lot of great press for us. We were all elated. That was just mind-blowing. It was super exciting and launched our science careers when we were in high school. I think for me, being good at science wasn't really a question I ever asked. It was just being so interested in asking the questions why and how. How else is there to better connect with truth and the world that, that we're born into? I can't believe it. It takes hours. Only for, only for 20 minutes. I always remember it. They're much better than the shiitake kind. For a hot pot? Yeah, shiitake is just kind of a little bit too For this kind of stuff? Yeah, I agree. I also like the the other bat tofu. What's that one? That's the oyster mushroom. No, no, no. The, no, no, no. Is it frozen tofu? Oh, yeah. frozen tofu. Yeah, yeah it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I'll put it in. Miranda is the only child. 
Sometimes when Jenny come, it's like I suddenly I have two daughters. <laughs> <laughs> they always help each other, support each other over the years like a family. That yeah, we treat so, Jenny as a family. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> Jenny's parents, uh, um, they uh, moved back to China uh, after she graduated from high school to uh, take care of their uh, grandparents. Yeah. I actually had a really tough time in high school. And I remember I would reach out to Jeannie and she was just so wonderfully supportive in those in those times. And I think that really solidified our, our friendship right after we won the science fair competition. I think people just really love the fact that we were working on breaking down plastics. Like the, we saw a real world problem. We were doing something with it in science and we didn't we didn't let the fact that we were students in high school stop us. At the same time, Ted was um, doing what's called the talent search, and we were scouted by the Vancouver uh, Salon event. And then after the talent search, they invited us to speak at their main stage event in 2013. Yeah, I think when we first got there, we were really terrified <laughs> about what we got ourselves into. People like Bono, Elon Musk, uh, the founders of Google, we're presenting that year. You know, we were just like two kids out of Vancouver in our first year of college. I was my first year at McGill University and Jeannie was at the University of Toronto. I think it showed us that, that we can dream bigger and we can take on, you know, a more um, active role as, as change makers in the world. I'm sketching our teacher and mentor, Mary Lee Taylor, who passed away in 2019. Miranda and I have had a lot of great mentors, but Mrs. Taylor was special. She sponsored our science fair project, and she even drove us down to the river to collect soil samples. She kept teaching while fighting cancer almost till the end. She was a very passionate teacher. I went to the University of Toronto to pursue a specialist degree in environmental sciences. In my second year of college, I started going to these career networking events. And I realized that most of the people coming to speak at these events are either from the oil industry or they're environmental consultants working for the oil industry. That's when I realized if I focus in environmental sciences, that's where I might end up in my career. And that's, that's the last thing I would want to do. You know, there is a lot of money coming from big oil, but that wasn't the shocking part. What was shocking was that one of the professors in the environmental science department was clearly a climate denier. As students, we can't just listen to what our professors are saying, but actually have to figure out how to create solutions. In 2015, we founded BioSelection, and we took this company to Silicon Valley. We just kind of decided, like, that's what we're going to do. And we went and we just, uh, we rented a little apartment. Yeah. <laughs> so this is neither of our hometowns. We yeah. didn't know anybody there. And we decided to just set up shop and start hiring scientists. You know, two young women fresh out of college mm -hmm. with no PhD starting to hire PhDs, right? I met Miranda and Jeannie a year ago. I was working at the University of Oxford at the time with some incredible scientists on some really interesting technology, but it wasn't technology that was going to be immediately applicable to the world. Getting your hands dirty in a small company that's actually here for the right reasons and is making the right products at the right time, I could see a way of affecting change immediately and I actually just felt a responsibility. I know that I can contribute to the world in a better way, and I was looking for the right technology to just make that jump. Miranda and Jeannie, they're the real deal. Um, <laughs> they're also very different. Miranda is the powerhouse. She comes into meetings with giant ideas, 
And Jeannie is completely the opposite. She will look at these ideas and then immediately start calculating, okay, how do we implement this? She's really, let's get it done type personality. I think there are two critical points in this journey. One was deciding to do this startup. That was more of Miranda's vision because she, you know, she really convinced me to keep doing this and that this was going to get somewhere and, you know, we're making a contribution. And the second turning point was when uh, we had to pivot away from the biology and realizing that the biology was too difficult to handle trash. We knew that for plastic to break down quickly, that this was a chemical challenge. That, you know, the bacteria were breaking down plastics because they were performing biochemistry on it. <laughs> it was kind of a painful period because, you know, we knew that we had to move away from biology and go into chemistry, but we didn't exactly know how. And so we were trying these different things, but then eventually got to a point where we realized that if we wanted to get better science data, we needed actual scientific instruments and equipment to, mm -hmm. do the, to even do the experiments. And, you know, we didn't have the funding to get that type of equipment. So this is part of <laughs> the next chapter, which was yeah. uh, kind of crazy <laughs> the way we decided to, to, yeah. to send you off to Arizona. Very serendipitously, we were visiting the waste plant in Phoenix. We were just like, oh wow, that sounds really cool. Let's go check it out. We really want to see this. So we went and we saw these equipment that were lying there and they were the exact equipment that we wanted to use. We saw that the lab was kind of like empty and so we were asking, is this lab open for a collaboration? Can we come and use your equipment here? And they were like, oh yeah, totally. And we can like, you know, put a postdoc on your project. So I moved to Arizona and so back used to the a student life, so I'm living <laughs> It was actually great because it was just the research and it was just the desert and the sunset. So it was a really wonderful period. And we were able to get a proof of concept. One of the methods was hmm. promising enough for us to bring back to our lab in California. When we look and consider the plastic problem in comparison to some of the other problems, the plastic problem is different because the plastic problem is something that we can absolutely fix with the science that exists today. This is pallet wrap. This is what you wrap goods in before it's shipped all over the world. And so this stuff has very small recycling markets today and it's really what our process is best at. So top of here, takes our dirty pallet wrap, shreds it, and feeds it into our one reactor system. So it's in this reactor that we're taking the plastic and we're converting it into new building blocks. This is the first step of our process. It takes six hours to break down these plastics. We're taking polyethylene, which is one of the hardest to recycle plastics, and we're upcycling it because not only are we recycling the plastic, but we're turning it back into materials that inherently can be recycled again and again and again. So the, the product that comes out of our reactor is one of the building blocks for many of the materials that you come into contact with every day your nylons, your nylon jackets. Nylon is one of the major components in all motor vehicles, the powertrain, some of the dashboard. Also, we can create polyurethane. That's the type of material that's going into your sports equipment. It's also your running shoes. And when we designed our system, we made sure that our oxidants and the chemicals that we use can be regenerated. So we think about the environment at every step in our process. There's only so much you can do when you talk to people. It's much more powerful when you show them. Because once you show people what the future can look like and how it can be different, and that things that they believe have no hope is actually solvable, you know, you don't need to do much convincing anymore from there. Once you have developed your first solution, don't be afraid to challenge it. Maybe you know you need to improve your solution to create something better. So be in love with the problem. We're coming to the end of extraction, the age of extraction. I know people are very gloom and doom right now about the carbon situation we're in, and it's very serious. We don't have that much time. So instead of extracting the carbons to build stuff, 
we can open up landfills. Landfills are mines full of plastics. We now have enough carbon on the surface of our planet for us to build for eternity. By the year 2050, if we continue generating plastic pollution at the rate that we are now, we're going to have more plastics than fish in the oceans. I think as, a, as an act of conscience, it's our obligation to do the right thing here. You know, youth in this generation is actually really exciting. The change is never going to be comfortable, but and the earlier you choose to jump in and embrace it, the more say you will have in how that change happens. I think that is going to have a very direct impact on your sense of control. It's time to rise up to the challenge that um, is given, handed to this generation.